네, 영, 영어로 하겠습니다. Good afternoon. This uh, special session, the theme is uh, audacious challenge. Imagine the impossible. 불가능 것을 불가능하다고 생각하는 것을 꿈꿔라. 이런 그 세션이 되겠습니다. We are most fortunate and grateful for having two eminent speakers today. Jim Clifton is chairman and the CEO of a world famous Gallup and Ms. Natalie Ruazu, director of Ecol National the Administration. So for each speaker, I will make brief introduction later on before they speak. I am Songmo Steve Kang, president of KAIST, and I'm greatly honored to moderate this session. I'm thrilled that this was uh, the most popular session among 23 sessions. There were 1,400 pre-registrants for this session, and we only have uh, 264 seats uh, in this room. I understand there are other rooms uh, in which people are watching uh, this uh, session. I also thank you sincerely for your participation. Uh, at the end of uh, two uh, talks, we will open up for Q&A session, and uh, I sincerely hope that you have active participation by asking constructive uh, good questions. Uh, if uh, I think your question is not that relevant, I may stop you. Uh, so it's very important that uh, we <laughs> focus on uh, this uh, important uh, theme of uh, audacious challenge. Imagine the impossible. Let me first introduce uh, first speaker, Mr. Jim Clifton. Jim is a chairman and CEO of Gallup, which is an 80 years old company. As he has been CEO and the chairman since uh, 1988. I double checked with him because that's a 28 years is a very, very long time. Gallup as uh, many of us know, is a leader in organizational consulting and the public opinion research. His Gallup World Poll gives uh, 7 billion people a voice in virtually all global issues. Under his re leadership, Gallup increased 15 times its uh, billing volume, increasing business uh, uh, 15 times grew to have 40 offices in 30 countries and regions. He also is a creator of the Gallup Path, a metric-based economic model that links human nature in workplace, customer engagement, and business outcomes. He serves on several boards, including the role of a chairman of the third good Marshall College Fund. The good Marshall is a black college in the United States. He has received many honorary degrees from Jackson State University, which is another black college, Medgar Evers University, another black college, and Bellevue University. He also authored a book called The, the Coming Job War. His talk will be the will of the workplace has changed. So with that introduction, Jim, all yours. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much to the uh, Global HR Forum uh, for having an interest in uh, Gallup and, uh, and the research that we do. It means a lot to me and it means a lot to my whole, uh, my whole tribe. I wanted to start, Dr. Kang, by saying what I think the biggest problem in the world is. And I think you know this very well in Korea. I sure know it as an American. But productivity is grinding down. And it's been grinding down for a full decade. As citizens of the planet, we're sort of going out of business. 
Now, that's kind of a miserable remark to open a lecture with, but I think I know a solution. But I just want to give you a few, just a couple of important facts. You guys know what productivity is? I, I didn't know. I got some of our economists together, and I said, I don't understand what, I don't understand what productivity is. And, and what it is, basically, it's GDP divided by per capita, divided by the number of people. So the, world was, the world's GDP about six years ago was, let's say, 6%. And then it's gone five and a half, five, four and a half, four, three. You, see, you can see where it's going, right? We're going out of business. The whole world's going out of business. So what's wrong? How could we be doing so well up to about 2008, just soaring, and now we're crashing? And we didn't just dip down and come back up. But what it means is per capita, productivity for the whole world is in decline. It's sort of the other global warming. So you got the Earth not doing very well, but then you got productivity. That's what you and I are in charge of. We're in charge of productivity for the world. The way we're trying to solve it right now is we're trying to solve it with governments. We think you can fix it with fiscal tools. We think you can fix it with policies. The reason I think it's the biggest problem in the world is because the way the world has changed, human development, how we develop as humans, occurs in the workplace more than it does in society. It's a big sociological shift. So you see, if we don't have that right, this is going to keep, this is going to keep grinding down. Productivity in Korea and in the United States of America, which I know best, they're both negative. United States of America's productivity five years in a row has been zero. The United States of America has no problem bigger than that one. Before I tell you what I think the solution is, I want to tell you a little something about Dr. Kang, the guy that founded our company we were talking about. He was, he was an academic. I would imagine the most famous academic in the history. He makes the list of 100 most influential Americans. His name is Dr. George Gallup. He makes the list with the real good list with George Washington and Ben Franklin and all those, all those types on it. But as an academic, he just had one mission. And he had it in a great line wh where he said, if democracy is about the will of the people, somebody should go find out what that will is and go talk to uh, millions of people and write down what they want out of life. What will make your life meaningful? What are you going for in life? Then write that down. So you might say, Dr. Gallup, why did you want to know that? Here's what he said. He said that leaders, people like you and me, people like the president of Korea or uh, Canada, Mexico, United States, Britain, whoever it might be, when they think they know what's on your mind, and are wrong, so they're wrong about the basic premise of what a constituency, a society, all the employees in a company, whatever it is, when they're wrong about what they're thinking, the more you lead and the more strategies you make and the more policies you make, the worse you make the world when you're dead wrong about what people want, what their dreams are, what's on the the hearts and minds of a population of people. Our company was founded 80 years ago, so I can only go back 80 years. But if you said, Jim, over those 80 years, I'm sorry, I, just, I look at my watch here because I want to right, keep us right on time. Over 80 years of all that data, all those polls of, from 160 countries, what's the biggest discovery you've seen? or the most significant sociological shift. I'm going to tell you which one I think it is because it has to do with us fixing the world and fixing productivity 
and fixing GDP growth. Growth is slowing. When we asked America 80 years ago what they wanted out of life, what they said is they wanted freedom. That was it. So if you and I were walking around Los Angeles or Dallas or Boston or Omaha or Kansas City or somewhere 80 years ago, that's what was on their minds. And then it shifted. And it shifted to peace. So after a while, Americans didn't want any more war. It's, it's a big shift. The next one was family. And that brings you up until about 10 years ago. It's broad general. But I'm going to tell you now what it shifted to. And it might sound subtle when I first say it. I think it's the biggest sociological shift of the last 100 years. It went from freedom to peace to having a family to having a good job. And that's for the whole world. The will of the world has changed just in the last 10 years. Started a little bit before that. I, I'm almost a perfect person to be talking about this because I'm a baby boomer. So I'm an, old, I'm an old guy. So if you have, I see millennials in the, in the audience. You and I are exact opposites. Because when I was your age, I was in a college in a university in the Midwest. And my only goal was to have a family. I wanted to marry a woman. I didn't have my eye on one yet, but I knew what I wanted. I wanted to remember one, freedom, peace. I was in that one, in the family. I wanted to have three kids. I wanted to own my house. I wanted to have a yard with grass. And I wanted to have a, a station wagon you know, some kind of a car. That's all I wanted out of life. So if you said, Jim, what about your job? I would say, I don't care what my job is. I just want a salary of $20,000. That's what I wanted. So having a rich life was 100% about family and zero about my job. And that overstates where baby boomers were. But you see, now you have this new population. They're already 40% of the world's workforce. will soon be 50% and then 60%. It's just the opposite. For them, number one, their 100% is about having a fulfilling job and family second. It changes the whole fabric of, of 7 billion people. Because you see, my first thought was married, have kids, own a house. And theirs is get a good job, where I can go do something meaningful so I have a meaningful life. Two very different thoughts. So maybe we've built the workplace. We built the workplace for me. So if I come to work and I don't like my boss, I don't like the mission and purpose of the company. If you're my boss, you didn't care what I thought, and I didn't care what you thought, because it's just a functional position. Think how it's changed population and growth. Millennials get married much later in life, at least 10 years later than my generation, or they don't get married at all. So, so marriage rates in Korea and America and Canada and West Europe, they're the lowest they've ever been. Think about that. Marriage as an institution may be going away. Whoever thought that one would be disrupted? Here's another thing. Millennials have far fewer children. It's been cut in half. Or they don't have any children at all. So you see how it's changing the fabric of our... It's not a subtle change. It changes how we populate. But then it goes on and on. Remember I said I wanted to own a home? I did right away. Had a, owned a home at 23. Millennials don't even want to own homes. Home ownership, in, in, in at least in America, I, I didn't check that one on Korea, lowest home ownership 
we've ever had. 250 years, lowest home ownership. What's the point? The point is that the world's workplace is built still to serve me. And the workplace that we need is a brand new one, one that's very, very different, that serves millennials. I'm going to make a depressing remark. We are badly failing, badly failing. But I think it's fixable. There's 7 billion people in the world, and there's 5 billion adults. We built consistent sampling frames across 160 countries, so we get 98% of the population. And when we ask the 5 billion adults, what do you want most out of life? 3 billion of them say, I would give anything to have a good job. And a good job defined by the OECD or ILO is 35 hours a week with a paycheck from an organization with consistent work. That's it. Of the 3 billion, we said, would you have one? 1.2 billion said, I do. 1.8 billion don't have a full-time job with a paycheck. They have those informal jobs, which is kind of a cruel word for selling flowers in traffic or you know, a bunch of crappy part-time work. There's only 1.2 billion good jobs in the world. Gallup asked them a few questions such as, do you believe the organization that you work for cares about your development? It's a soft question, but that's what millennials want almost more than anything. We ask, do you have a job where the task at hand you have a capacity to perform or you have, it uses your strengths? Meaning that when you go to work, you have a job that you can do, and when you do it, it feels good. We call them engaged workers. We ask them, does the mission and the purpose of the company uh, make you feel that, uh, that your job is meaningful? Because remember with them, if their job's not meaningful, their life's not meaningful. Not so with me. Now, but not back then. But if I had a, if I had a graph up of, uh, um, with 1.2 billion me people across it, and you said, how many of them as managers are we delivering the great global dream, the answer is 15%. 15%. At the other end of the really miserable people that hate their boss, hate their job, and all, it's 25%. So it means evil is winning over. If you said, how could we fix the world? I bet my job, I bet my stock, if we could just double that 15%, we could do that. If we could double the 15% to 30%, productivity would change. These are inspired people. They feel good, so you've done a good job managing them. These people over here hate the company and do anything they can to tear it down. This is a seriously negative bunch. They hate inspiration. They like to drive customers away. It's a good day when they've made a customer mad. This is a really bad group. Then you get about 15% in the middle. All the growth in your organization comes from just that 15%. They create new customers. They get new ideas. They run great new teams. They run, um, uh, get projects done on time or early. Everything good happens in the 15%. You see the problem the world has? 15% is too small. It can't be smaller than the percent of people that are trying to tear it apart. So what we need to do is we need to figure out exactly what millennials want, and then we've got to change our workforce, workplace, from what Jim Clifton wanted as, a, as an old guy back then. We've got to change it to what millennials, to what millennials want. I'm going to check my watch here again. So that's how we're doing. So as a group of global managers, you and I, 15%. Korea is below 10%. It's very serious here. 
it's why you don't have growth or productivity. You're single digits. Employees in this country hate their jobs. You want to be more specific, they hate their managers. You need to know that. But it's very fixable. It's very fixable. I've seen big organizations take 15%, ones that have 100, 200, 300,000 employees. They'll take the 15% when they go to work on it and they'll drive it clear up to 60. That's what changes the culture. We got on one, I have, I have a slide deck here of one slide. I've never done a slide, I've never done a slide deck before, so this is my, this is my deck, Dr. Kang. And I don't have anything against slide decks. I'm very proud I have a deck. Even though it's one, can you do that? Can you call it a deck if it's only one slide? Okay, all right. You guys, that, it was a huge research project. I mean, hundreds of my professionals, we said, what is it that the world wants in a job and how's it different than old Jim Clifton, what he wanted with a job? So they had a report, and these guys can make reports that are 100, 200 pages easy. But I said to them, do not come into my office until you have it on one page. And they did. They worked and worked. You know, it takes a, it takes a long time. It's easier to do a 100-page report than to do a one-page report. Reminds me of what Abraham Lincoln said after the Gettysburg Address. They said that was the most, you know, it's, uh, j just only about that long. And he said, I would have made it even shorter if I would have had more time. Well, anyway, we got it on one page. The past. So me, I was just Mr. Paycheck. Just give me $20,000, maybe a company car, and you fulfilled the, the dreams of Jim Clifton for, for at least that part of it. It's so important. Remember, with a millennial, where their new will is a job, you have to do more than give them a paycheck because you have to talk to them about the meaning of their job. Does it, does it change society a little bit? How does it help customers? How do you link to the world? Am I changing the world a little bit? Because remember, what's different about this group compared to me is if their job doesn't have meaning, their life doesn't have meaning. Almost nobody in HR or CEOs don't, don't know that. But that's a big sociological shift. The, 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 the next one interested me, and I had to have him really carefully explain this to me. But we tend to try to create satisfaction. It's a very dangerous road to go down. Because you see, the millennial isn't thinking satisfaction. So there's a, this young lady right down here. See, if, if, if she said to me, if I came to Gallup, what, what can you offer me? See, if I'm going down the satisfaction road, I would say, You'll like this, uh, young lady. In the breaks in the morning and the breaks in the afternoon, I have volleyball courts set up outside the Gallup building in Washington, and you and your teammates can go play volleyball. Well, she says, I don't really like volleyball. I go, well, up on fifth floor, I've got ping pong tables. Does that get you anything? I don't really play. OK, OK, OK. I'll get you a latte machine. You want a latte machine? Well, I don't, even, I don't really drink coffee. Okay, okay, free lunch twice. You, get free, you want some free lunch? But you see where I'm going? It's a miss. Now, all that stuff would work for me, and it did. I, I had a job a long time. We had a bunch of stuff like that. We thought it was great. What she wants to know is what can she become. She wants to know if I'll take the time to really develop her because it's her life. It's not a job. So we've got to go from satisfaction to development. This third one, if you, and you know, there's a big movement going on right now where Accenture and Ernst and Young and the big four, Price Waterhouse and Microsoft and General Electric, they're all pulling out um, performance reviews, forced rankings, they're changing all of it. I know why they're doing it, because they know Accenture is hiring 100,000, I don't know if anybody's from Accenture, hiring 100,000 millennials just this year. They knew that they had a workforce that was set for people like Jim Clifton, and they wouldn't be able to keep their stars. You got to have the new work. You got to have the new workforce. But if you said, "What do you think that performance management movement's about?" It's about the practice of management. I, 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 do you know who Peter Drucker? Peter Drucker, uh, when you're as old as I am, I actually knew him. 
But there was a way that you managed, and it was more command and control. So when I would manage um, this young lady, I would tell her that she was late today. Um, I didn't like your report, and, um, I don't know, and you talk to me about when you want some days off. That's just command and control. The big shift is that we're going to go from command and control to a culture of coaching. I'd bet everything I got on it. And so managers, as, as uh, competent as they had to become on Six Sigma, Lean, TQM, whatever, so you get a black belt or you can't get promoted, now it's going, you're going to be able to differentiate yourself by how well I, I can coach her and actually develop her into something important. That's a big shift. My annual review, my ongoing conversations. There's a lady that was, um, there's a lady that's CEO of Deloitte. I don't know if it's Deloitte Americas or the whole thing. Ladies are never made CEOs of um, big four. I don't know, you got to come up through tax, I think it's a big break. But she wrote an article that's become very famous. You ought to Google it. But so she has a daughter in high school and one in college. And they're at home, and they're social, doing social uh, networking and stuff. Anyway, she says to him, stop doing that and get to work on your projects. And they said, we are working on our projects. They're communicating with their teams. And then the next thing that she found out really scared her. They were also, the teachers were also in the conversations. And so as they were working, the teacher would say, you're missing the assignment. That's not what I want. You're too much about this. It's got to be more about this. So they, I don't like your title. The title implies this. That's not what you're doing. And so they're changing it on the fly. Well, and of course, in that conversation, it makes it a lot easier to get an A because you're getting instant, immediate feedback from your team leader, who's the teacher. Technology has changed millennials from what, from what my generation was. But this really bright CEO, do you know what she thought to herself? Oh my gosh, they're getting instant, immediate feedback on the fly doing their projects from their team leader. They're going to come to Deloitte and we're going to give them feedback once a year. But you see how important the change in? How wrong our premise is with annual reviews? You've got to have some reviews, but without ongoing conversations, you can't be a great coach. It's a big sociological shift. I, tell, I say sociological because I believe 100% human development now occurs in the workplace more than it does in, in general society. This, this last one is... Uh, I'm watching my clock, so let's see. Um, because we didn't really care, we put in competencies. We have competencies at Gallup, so fine. But there's good competencies and bad competencies. But what I do with this young lady is I, I give her some, and I find gaps, right? You know what gaps are? It's what's wrong with her. So I say, we found some I found some things and I talked to her about it. Then I make a whole plan on how she can improve on these things I know about her that are wrong. I have some math to prove that she's not good at this. Then I call her into my office. I go, hey, I found, a couple more. I found some more things that are really wrong with you. And let's do this. You see what's happening? As her boss, I'm the world's leading living authority on what's wrong with her. Her relationship with me and the organization focuses on her weaknesses. We, we had a legacy psychologist at Gallup, died 12 or 15 years ago. It's um, become really famous after death. But he made a discovery that weaknesses never turn into strengths. There's not one body, there's no material anywhere where you can prove that weaknesses turn into strengths. But what he found is if you figure out what her strengths are and then build her plan around her strengths, her strengths develop infinitely throughout her, throughout her whole life. So it's just another thing that we've got wrong. But people like me didn't care. Millennials do. So when millennials come through, you need to have some kind of a process. We have something called Strengths Finder, Clifton Strengths. 
that we use on, we've used it on 15 million employees around the world. Uh, it's just booming everywhere. Probably some people in here, here have taken it. But we've got to change our, fo our focus from trying to fix weaknesses to, to building strengths. I'm going to suddenly, I'm just going to suddenly stop. But I just wanted to leave you with the, the, the last two things are just the closing. Why am I doing this? What's the switch? For, my, for the old man, it was just my job. For the millennial, it's my life. I'm very concerned about where the world is going right now because of the slow growth. It's increasing a little bit. But see, the problem is it's increasing at a decreasing rate. That's the simple math. So it means you go to zero and then to, then, and then to negative numbers. What I wanted to leave you with is I don't think governments, we should look to governments to fix this. They can make things worse or they can make things better. I think we've got to do this ourselves with our own hands. And I think if you and I don't fix it, I don't think anybody else is going to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Um, so now many of us uh, can see why he has been chairman and CEO for so long, a great leader, and uh, gave a very positive message from which we can all benefit. Uh, it's uh, my uh, pleasure to introduce our second speaker, uh, Ms. Uh, Nathalie Loazou. Uh, from France. She is a graduate of the Paris Institute of Political Sciences and of the National Institute of Origin. Oh, she, yeah, she is a graduate, yes, and uh, also a graduate of National Institute of Oriental Languages and Civilization in Mandarin Chinese. So I asked uh, Nathalie whether she speaks uh, Mandarin. Of course she does um, uh, fluently. She is a director of the French ENA, meaning Ecole Nationale de Administration since uh, October 2012. So she's been there for m more than uh, four years. She was a diplomat in the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs for 26 years. Uh, she worked at the Paris headquarters of the ministry, Indonesia, Senegal, Morocco, and the United States, but not China. So I did ask why not in China. <laughs> uh, recently, before ENA, she was a director of human resources and also Director General for the Administration of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in France. She has published uh, in uh, 2014 a book called uh, Tu," uh, meaning uh, Choose Everything. Uh, so maybe she can uh, tell us more about that, that book. Uh, I read a comment in the internet uh, somebody said it's all in French, but must be translated in English so that more people can read. Uh, this uh, book has been sold, uh, more than uh, 25,000 copies were sold. Um, but the, in this book, she talks about uh, barrier for women, uh, glass ceiling and that sort of thing. So, so Natalie is going to give a speech on teaching for the unknown how to live up to the challenge. With that, Natalie, please. Let us welcome her. Thank you, Ed. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today. Um, I will start by confessing something to you. As you said, uh, I'm head of a teaching and training institution, and still, having to prepare the next generation for a future I know very little about. This may have been true in the past. Imagine what was taught in schools at the begin beginning of the 20th century. What powers were influenced at the time, 
which industries were relevant and what to expect. Who had foreseen two world wars, the rise of the United States, the fall of colonial powers, or the division of Europe? I was born in a continent divided in two by the Iron Curtain, where people from Western Europe could hardly travel to the East, and where people from Eastern Europe were not allowed to travel to the West. This sounds familiar in this part of the world to many of you. Still, in the late 1980s, in just a few months, the Berlin Wall was down, then the Iron Curtain disappeared and the USSR collapsed. The European Union enlarged to become the largest and most integrated regional organization. More and more countries pre pressed to enter the EU from Ukraine to Turkey. There seemed to be no limit to the attractiveness of this bold political and economic construction. And then, suddenly, a few months ago, one of the most prominent members of the EU, the UK, voted to leave the Union. Whether rational or not, the decision was widely unexpected, maybe even by Gallup. The level of preparation of the UK for the consequences of the Brexit is so low that no one really knows how long the process will take and what its consequences will be, both for London and for the rest of Europe. So in 40 years, we have traveled from a durably divided Europe to a reunified continent, an enlarged and more integrated EU, and now the departure of one of its most important members. The question is, how were these topics taught along the way? What was presented once as certainties, which turned out to be false some years later? So yes, indeed, it has always been difficult to teach and train the next generation for your future we know little about. But this assertion has never been as strong as nowadays. Think about it. 60% of professions which will be practiced in 2030 don't yet exist, at least according to a survey released in 2015 by the American consulting firm WagePoint. As breathtaking as it sounds, the move has already started. Some of the most sought after jobs of our decade did not exist in 2000. Do you believe that at the turn of the millennium, employers were looking for sustainable development experts, mobile apps developers, cloud computing technicians, data miners, or community managers, and could hardly find them? It makes it hard to guess which will be the new professions of 2030. Which point suggestions are digital architects, elderly well-being consultants, nanomedics, avatar managers, vertical farmers. They may be right or not. Meanwhile, some professions may soon have completely disappeared. We used to ask travel agencies to organize our trips abroad. Now that we travel much more than before, we simply rely on websites for recommendations coming from other travelers to choose our hotels and air companies. Even existing jobs are changing dramatically due to the influence of three main factors, technical progress, globalization, and new expectations from citizens and cust customers alike. I won't comment much on technical progress, because first, I'm not an expert, and second, because we all see the impact on our lives and on the rapid change of business models 
and job expectations of this technical progress. The digital revolution creates new opportunities, new jobs, and destroys older ones at a very fast pace. We all know about the impact of internet on professions like taxi drivers. We suspect that the consequences of the use of 3D printers are still widely underestimated. We try to get a sense of the opportunities and risks brought to us by the R&D on artificial intelligence. We haven't yet figured out what the contrary of technical progress, something like technical regression, really means for our societies. But it might well be underway due to the effects of global warming and a foreseeable scarcity in hydrocarbons as well as in some food products in the coming decades. For example, we would never have thought that Bob Dylan could have received the Nobel Prize for Literature. And still, he told us long ago, the times, they are changing. I may comment somewhat more on globalization. Because when we think we know what it is about, especially here in Asia, when we think about globalization, we think openness of trade markets, accelerated circulation of goods and services. Let me talk a little bit once again about Europe. In Europe, what we see right now is somewhat different. We start to face the consequences of, on our territories of conflicts and crises happening elsewhere. Think about the arrival of migrants coming mostly from Africa, the Middle East, or, or Afghanistan, and the political reactions that this arrival triggers. Let us be frank, refugees and migrants are not that many, and we are a rich and aging continent. They come looking for a better future and could be welcome. Frankly speaking again, our populations don't see it that way. There is a growing fear that people from different cultures, different religions, will change the identity of old countries in Europe. And this fear is fed by another kind of globalization, the global terrorist threat. If you add the idea that climate change might push more people to migrate from impacted regions to more protected ones, the sense of globalization tomorrow might become very different to that of today. Already, drug traffickers, human traffickers, smugglers, hackers, terrorists pay little attention to classical state borders they are old professions turn new. We obviously struggle hard with few results to fight them. In some parts of the world, even in some parts of our developed countries, underground economies spread just as fast or even faster than legal ones. I would also like to stress how much new expectations of citizens and consumers alike transform traditional professions. These new expectations take advantage of the avalanche of information customers and citizens receive through a multitude of media. Consumers want transparency, accountability, and they have new tools to achieve their objectives. Boycott of goods, depending on their origin, their ingredients or the working conditions of workers who produce them are only starting and may well spread. Social and environmental clauses are scrutinized by investors to make sure that businesses don't risk being depreciated in the eye of their customers. This evolution has not yet reached the poorest part of the population which cannot afford to make a distinction on staple commodities other than related to their price. But 
the rise of a large middle class in many emerging economies and the change in consumer habits in the developed world follow the same path towards more demanding requirements. This can apply similarly to the attitude and expectation of citizens toward their governments and civil service. Better informed, used to the quality of service of private providers such as mobile phone operators, citizens consider their public services with a new eye and less indulgence. They expect transparency, efficiency, they reject corruption, conflicts of interests, and their willingness to pay taxes depends on the quality of service they witness. Furthermore, citizens tend to reject decisions taken top-down without being duly consulted and associated. Building new dams, new airports, new wind turbines becomes harder than it used to be due to the mobilization of citizens' associations. There is little doubt that these changes will have numerous consequences on the skills which are expected from new generation entering the labor market. Adaptability, openness, capacity to interact are not only human qualities which favor a balanced personal life. They have become very much looked after soft skills which one should develop during his or her training years. It goes with the capacity to embrace not only the effects of technological changes, but the evolution of the society, which necessitates a solid understanding of where we come from and what might be the lessons of history, geography, and social sciences together. Talking about students entering the, wor the working market, do you realize to what extent the number of students reaching higher education is booming? There are almost twice as many students in the world this year than in 2000. We went from 100 million students in 2000 to 196 in 2012, according to the UNESCO Institute for Statistics. Asia accounts for 66% of the total increase. Mass education is without hesitation the biggest challenge we all face. It's an exciting one. Never in our planet's history has there been such a proportion of young generations reaching higher education. It's a fantastic opportunity. One of the vectors of this transformation comes from the access to education for young people coming from the emerging countries. In 2000, there were one quarter less students in the BRICS than in developed countries. This year, they account for three quarters more. But beside this fantastic opportunity, new questions arise regarding the business model of higher education. Who should pay for it? invest in it, design it, and manage it. In emerging economies, about 13% of household income goes to education, whereas it's only 2% in the US or the UK. But money goes first to primary and secondary education, much less to higher education in emerging countries. The key question becomes, in developed countries and emerging countries alike, whether public spending, tuition fees, or private donors finance the universities required by the rising number of students. There is no easy answer to that question. Public spending faces limits, and universities are getting poorer due to budget restrictions. It's very hard to get more public money dedicated to students' educations, whereas money for research may still be available. The raise in tuition fees creates other kinds of dilemma when students' debts surge in a number of countries. Everywhere we have to consider education in general and higher education in particular 
for what it is, a collective investment in the future of one's country's human resources, which deserve appropriate financial support. Providing quality education to rising number of students is thus a challenge. No less of a challenge is to find a way to open the most selective educative and training pathways to greater diversities. I come from a country where these most selective pathways are embodied by what we call grandes écoles rather than university. The National School of Administration, which I'm heading, is one of them, as well as the Ecole Polytechnique, whose chairman is present at this conference, and some others. They stand at the top of our higher education system in terms of prestige and professional perspective for their alumni. Access to these very selective schools is based on meritocracy. Competitive exams open to candidates irrespective of their gender, age, social or ethnic origin. The only relevant criteria of selection are based on talent. The system may be somewhat different in other countries, but the idea that a limited number of very selective institutions provide students with major job opportunities is still widespread. Therefore, the question is, do we rely on pure meritocracy, offering every talent a chance to be selected, or do we favor some sort of social reproduction where sons and grandsons of today's elite have a better chance to navigate the system than newcomers? In most countries, the answer is alarming. Let us simply consider the absence of women in the most selective pathways, whereas they count for more than half of the world population, and they generally outperform boys in primary and secondary education. Losing them along the way amounts to accepting a major waste, waste of talent, of money, and of opportunities for growth. Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, perfectly understand it, but he faces strong resistance. More generally, to foster and to implement equal opportunity policies that really work is a huge challenge and an urgent one. I will address it later, and I consider it key because traditional elites are more and more decried. One might argue that criticizing the elites is pretty often suspicion, suspicious, as it comes from demagogues and populists alike. This might well be true, but we should avoid inviting criticism by making sure that we do live up to our principle of openness and equal opportunity. Yet another challenge faces each and every teaching and training institution. We are knowledge factories and knowledge providers, but we face an overwhelming sort of competition. Thanks to the internet, knowledge is everywhere and easily accessible. Why should we gather students in a classroom to listen to lectures they can watch on the web? What is the role of libraries? Well, paper books account for a decreasing part of the learning material students need to get. And going from knowledge to know-how, how do we transmit know-how when we take it for granted that it will soon be outdated? The notion of transmission itself takes less and less space in our syllabi. Some skills remain valid, such as for a public management school like ENA, negotiating skills, crisis management skills, project management methods. But what about innovation? Thinking out of the box, creativity, which our current world requires much more than ever before. Is there a method to transfer creativity? How to handle 
the digital revolution and decide what we want to make of it rather than having tools, robots, algorithms and IA deciding for us is yet another challenge. Mastering the impacts of digitalization in all sectors of our society requires that we provide the current and next generations with appropriate knowledge, skills, and reflection capacities. We have long lived with the idea made popular in the 18th century that an honest man, as we would call him in France, was able to embrace most of the relevant knowledge of his time and take enlightened or informed decisions. Who would believe it today, considering the complexity and variety of opportunities and threats provided by the digital revolution? Isn't there a risk that political and business leaders behave like the characters of Plato's allegory of the cave and take their decisions according only to the shadows of the upcoming reality? The number and importance of these challenges must encourage us, teaching and training institutions, but also students and workers from the new generation to adopt new approaches. Let me share with you some of my personal conviction based on what I experiment and implement as the head of a renowned training institution. First conviction, complexity requires diversity. Today, neither businesses nor institutions can afford to waste talents. They have to attract and keep the best and the brightest. It is their job, but also the mission of training institutions to detect talents, attract them, train and accompany them towards success. Which means that equal opportunity policies are not more necessary than ever, considering gender, social and ethnic biases which dominate recruitment and selection processes approximately everywhere. Every single student must be certain that according to his or her talents, his or her ambitions, he or she will find a way to make it flourish. We have to act at an early age to fight against such phenomena as self-censorship. There are no such jobs as made for old white male only. That being said, the moment you hear about jobs and the way to join professions you know little about is key. The earlier, the better. Primary school is the place to fight against unconscious biases, gain self-confidence and improve social skills. Secondary school is the place where the diversity of talents must be detected and welcome. There is nothing like an order of precedence between, for instance, craft industry and high-tech, social sciences and maths, or there should not be, according to job opportunities in each and every category. But education goes often with ideology. Therefore, the idea that mass education should equal massive efforts to teach all students the same curriculum in the same format is a widespread mis mistake leading to widespread failure. It is crucial that every single student is given the chance to make his or her own choice according to his or her specific type of talent. Methods exist which focus on knowledge and skills and their objective evaluation and avoid unconscious biases and prejudices. They must be widely adopted and implemented as early as at secondary school level onwards. Educational guidance is also of the essence. How can you choose your study path when you know little about where it leads to? We should all participate fully in the effort to make our institutions known but also to make various professions better understood. Otherwise, the winners of the system are the insider's sons. In most of the selective study pathways, you find an abnormal rate of teachers and professors' sons and daughters. This amounts to a cultural insider's dealing 
and this is not acceptable. In ENA, we have focused very much on this notion of diversity, which lays the foundation of our meritocracy system. Our recruitment process includes a specific training of the juries about unconscious biases, objective assessment of listed competences and skills, permanent evaluation of the non-discriminatory nature of our selection. We provide specific preparation for our exams to students coming from underprivileged backgrounds, helping them to meet implicit social expectations from future employers. We publicize our school, our entry exams, jobs in the civil service, in areas where people are not familiar with the grand école environment. This is what we can do, and we know it's not sufficient. A joint effort from the school system, from primary education to top level higher education institutions, including employers and media, is necessary to prevent social, gender, and ethnic reproduction. It should be no less than a political priority but I don't think most political leaders view it that way. Teaching innovation also requires that we innovate in our teaching methods. Having said that, I don't believe one can teach knowledge which is available everywhere and transmit know-how which changes all the time. What do we do? Do we close our schools and rely on Wikipedia and YouTube? I don't think so. And I'm absolutely convinced that schools have a key role, but a new one. To determine why it is worth going to a school, one has to make clear distinction between what you can learn by yourself and where you need an added value. Reversed classrooms rely on that basic principle. You learn at home, you exercise in class. Cases, studies provide a way to connect theory with practice. Serious games and simulations bring students nearer to a professional approach of their academic knowledge. Moreover, it illustrates something that education is still very poor at transmitting. There are only collective victories. Being a brilliant and competitive individual is easier than being part of a collective successful group. I don't share the idea that the coming word is about more and more competition between individuals to survive, as I read in the concept note of our conference. I'm fully convinced that the challenges ahead call for more cooperation, more collaborative approaches, a higher, higher value for sharing than for owning goods and services, and this has already started. But if you want to foster innovation and creativity, we have to go one step further and encourage experiments. A lab mindset should not be limited to experimental sciences, but may, may be expanded to each and every discipline. One of the most important lessons from experiments is failure. To fail is the best way to learn. Our teach it, teaching systems must include failure as part of learning processes. Let's go back for a while to diversity. Diversity is not only for students. If complexity requires diversity, one must apply the recipe to teaching and training institution as well. This includes diversity in the faculty. There is much to expect from cross-fertilization between scholars and practitioners. Universities tend to be the last bastions of traditions where you could where you become professor after a long and often painful journey. Your reputation may have more to do with your research and the articles you publish than with your teaching abilities, the result of your students, or their ability to find a job. Practitioners may have little teaching experience and theoretical background, but they enrich themselves from the contact with academics and they enrich the students' visions with their professional skills. Diversity also means transdisciplinary approaches. This is the place where the resistance is sometimes the toughest. Economists don't like lawyers who have little interest for inter historians or sociologists, and I mentioned simply social sciences. 
still in the current world, we have no other choice than to break barriers between disciplines and try to embrace a broader view of complex issues. How can private law foster economic growth? What does behavior sciences teach us about change management? These are two simple, plain examples, and one could think of a thousand, thousand ones where a single discipline approach has become too narrow. Diversity is also about bridging the gap between the private and the public sector. I am the director of a senior public management school. That is to say that my students will join the public administration and meet the specific and complex requests from their fellow citizens regarding public services. Business schools may be completely different. They train students to become private company managers. Still, I know no place on earth where the public and the private sectors don't interact. You may decide as a student that you have a preference for the former or the latter, but ignoring how to improve interactions between the two simply makes you, the institution and the country you work for, weaker. Partnership between different types of schools and universities are key as well. Beyond a transdisciplinary approach, we have to favor more contacts and interactions between teaching and training institutions which focus on very different specialties to create innovative teaching. For instance, at ENA, we partner with designer schools, developer schools, and engineer schools in order to feed our teaching with different ways of thinking and doing things. Our students experiment projects together and enrich themselves mutually from these encounters. A better dialogue between theory and practice leads to more interaction between researchers and decision makers. Too often, the infinite variety of academic knowledge remains limited to the use of experts and is not taken into consideration by decision makers, may them be private or public. Too often, researchers consider their activity as pure and protected from the outside world. We have a joke that says, I would like to live in theory because as far as the theory goes, so far so good. Still, we need to connect more effectively researchers, prospective experts and decision makers. Challenges of the time make it more relevant than ever before. Climate change, energy transition, demographics and migrations, religious and political radicalization, all these major issues require that scholars and deciders interact constantly. But even more than before, complexity and the rapid path of change requires that we boost to students' reflection, critical approach, and ability to contextualize problems. This brings us back to good old principles, ethics, liberal studies, humanities are not things of the past, but topics of the present and basic requirements of the future. We have focused very much on the technicity of knowledge and know-how in various fields. We must pay attention not to get lost in technicity without any sort of appropriate compass. Knowing what is desirable is as important as knowing what is feasible. Ethics is, one of, is of utmost importance for disciplines like medicine, artificial intelligence, or nanotechnologies. Philosophy trains the brain better than Sudoku to embrace complex issues. History tells us that you can hardly know where you go if you ignore where you come from. There is obviously room for improvement in the way we organize students' curriculum. They learn much more than in the past by traveling much more abroad, which is a very positive asset. But we all know from experience that these years off are more about coming of age than going to school. There is probably something more to be done in order that students whatever their field of specialty becomes, constantly ask themselves questions related to culture and liberal studies. 
Of course, training is a lifelong process, and there are things that you don't learn at school. Still, a working life is not always a balanced, as, as balanced as it should be, and time for reflection does not come so easily. My last message would be this one. You only live your youth once. Live it fully, comprehensively, enthusiastically. enthusiastically. Don't be afraid of the future. It belongs to you. Make it what you long for, not what you're terrified of. A famous thinker, Antonio Gramsci, advised to combine pessimism of the mind with optimism of the will. Please focus on the latter. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let us give a big applause to both the speakers, please. Thank you. So I do have uh, questions here, and uh, I believe we have uh, about 20 more minutes, so we, ha we do have time. Um, so let's see. Um, let let's uh, ask uh, Jim uh, the question. Um, so it's written in uh, Korean, so I have to translate. Uh, I'm not a good translator, but uh, <laughs> so it, it says, Jim, uh, in Korean society, uh, the uh, retirement, a guarantee for retirement at particular age is uh, a big uh, attraction. Um, uh, but uh, if you choose a company or organization that does not guarantee uh, such a retirement age, uh, what if also um, I do not get satisfaction uh, for my growth and uh, uh, other uh, necessary uh, things. Uh, uh, you know, if, if I'm not satisfied, should I quit and then uh, I try to find uh, other jobs? So what, what is your answer, Jim? Any good advice? Uh, what? <clears throat> um, is this, I think they lit, is this lit up? Can you hear this? Yeah, this one works, doesn't it? Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, an interesting finding that uh, Gallup had was that, that people tend to join companies. So they're real proud they joined, I don't know, Gallup or Samsung or some kind of a company. You join the company, you're excited, but you quit your boss. So you don't quit the company, you quit your boss. And so, one answer I would have is that if you're, uh, for the person that asked the question, if you're miserable in your position, the, the cause is almost always your boss. And <clears throat> so uh, what, one of the things you do is you might look around and see if there's other bosses before you quit. Uh, maybe even talk to your boss. Um, but I mean, nine times out of 10, that's the problem. When you have big variation in companies, um, you know, where, where there's one unit that's real productive and another one that's not productive, has a lot of mistakes and errors and safety, all that kind of thing. 70% of the variation can be uh, found just in the quality of the manager. So goes the manager, so goes the company. So, but I, I wouldn't quit yet. I would try to, I'd try to figure out how I can get a better boss. Thank you. Um, it reminds me a... Uh, uh, an important question to Jim. Um, you are leading a big organization, Gallup, uh, worldwide organization, and uh, you are a great leader. You've been a great leader for 28 years, and uh, I'm sure that uh, there are female employees of your organization, but uh, can you tell us, uh, you know, the Gallup, uh, when you joined, when you took leadership 28 years ago, uh, the status of women uh, in your organization, and the nowadays, how are they different? And if you made a difference, uh, how did you do it? Well, <clears throat> Dr. Kang, I'm not very proud of this, but I would say 30 years ago, I ran a company that was all men. All managers, all everybody, uh, especially the man, I think it was 100% men. 
And um, then we try to put quotas in. Quotas are cruel. They don't work. But now we have a company that's 55% of the key manager positions are women. And we found that there's kind of a trick to this. So I, I'm chairman and CEO. Then we have somebody that's COO. And then you have a CFO. Those, of course, are the top three jobs. You will never successfully um, ha uh, take advantage of having, as Natalie mentioned, um, a full workforce until one of those three positions is a woman. There's a story at Gallup where, <clears throat> so as soon as we made the COO a woman, there were just women everywhere. I guess men hire men and women hire women. That's what it looks like to me. But I walked into our boardroom and there were all women around the table with, with just one guy, and the COO was at the end. And I walked in, just kind of doing my thing, goes, hey, what's going on here? And the COO at the end looked at me and she said, these are the people that run Gallup. And I said, oh. I said, what do I do here? And she said, you are now the token male. <laughs> but uh, but I, don't, I don't think that policies will change, will boom women into the workplace. That you, you got to get a woman in one of those top three jobs. And, um, you know, quotas, you meet, they, they're well-meaning. I thought that might work. But when you put women in jobs or minorities or whatever because you can't find anybody else and they're token, it, uh, um, I think that destroys the individual and it certainly doesn't solve your problem. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Natalie. Uh, in Korea, there is uh, the semester for searching a job in second semester of a grade seven. It's like a junior you know, a high school, a grade seven. I want to listen your opinion of the timing of the first job searching lectures and the programs uh, of uh, Korea. Uh, so this person is asking, is it too early or too late? Or yes, what is your opinion on this? I think knowing about jobs, professions, uh, the earlier the better. Because um, otherwise, uh, some people will have uh, more guidance than others, uh, considering their family uh, uh, origin, and they will be privileged. So uh, having people uh, know because maybe uh, at the end of high school, or maybe even earlier, what professions are about, and maybe have internships uh, in some companies is extremely positive for their uh, later uh, professional orientation. Okay, thank you. We have many, many questions. You have uh, given excellent talks, that's why so many questions here. Um, the next question is uh, for Jim. Um, let's see, uh, great deal to me to ask you a question. And I'm wondering, so this person is uh, very appreciative uh, of opportunity to ask you a question. Uh, so this question is a really big question. <laughs> what is the biggest discovery in your life? <laughs> this is college student is asking you this question. Must be a big question for him to consider so long. Um, <clears throat> well, I don't know all this talk. Give you, <laughs> I, I because you because these are HR people. I'll I'll say that that um, I think the most profound contribution that we've made to human development is one of our legacy psychologists I think changed the world with his discovery about strengths. This would have been 50 years ago he walked into a library, wanted to be a psychologist. I notice there's a lot of psychologists here. And he went into the library and psychology is a study of all the, all the syndromes of what's wrong with people. 
And <clears throat> so he kept looking through. And anyway, he went to the librarian and said, I'm looking for a book that has a taxonomy of what's right with people. And the uh, librarian said, there's no book like that. Nobody studied what's right with people. And he wondered if there would be more advancements in the study of what's right with people rather than the massive study of what's wrong with people. And that discovery led us to that uh, if you really want to boom productivity, if you really want to boom individuals, you want to boom the development of your kids or, or your teams or whoever it is, that you focus on their strengths, not their weaknesses. That's a very new discovery, and it's still being talked into the world. But leaders, thought leaders, get off on the wrong things, and they don't mean to be wrong. They're just wrong. But we've been wrong about how you develop humans, and you don't develop them by fixing their weaknesses. It just simply doesn't work. And, uh, but what our teams at Gallup discovered is that by clinically identifying their strengths and a strategy around those, then everything changes. That, that might be, we've had some pretty big ones, but that's one of our biggest ones. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. So we have uh, also so many questions. Your, your Gallup is very popular. Um, so the next question uh, is coming from a uh, professional working for a motor company. Um, so you talked about the millennial, uh, and uh, there is a, a need to understand millennials. Uh, but uh, in reality, uh, especially in uh, Korean companies, they don't recognize uh, such importance. Uh, so you know that's a reality. Uh, so how? How can I, this person, uh, can uh, suggest or convince uh, the leaders of companies, uh, you know, uh, to change their attitude or perspective? Uh, would you give me good advice? Well, I think it's a. I think if you were to talk to your senior leaders, it's really a good time. The, the timing's perfect because most great companies right now have stopped growing. And the only way they can grow is, is by acquiring other companies. The whole world is acquiring each other because CEOs have given up on growth. Right here in Korea, the CEOs of Korean companies have just given up. So what they do is they acquire their competitors, then cut jobs. I love big companies. I love CEOs, so I'm, not, I'm just saying. But what they're doing now doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> And, and then they have sales, but it's not organic growth. They're not growing from the spirit of their organization like they originally were founded, how they built a great orga organization. But if you went and said to them, how would you like to grow organically? Because there's far more money in that than there is in ruining the balance sheet with acquisitions and all that. They go, yeah, I'd love to. How do I do that? Tell them that there's more low-hanging fruit in the engagement and lack of engagement in Korean workplaces, in our workplace here at work, than there is in acquisitions. And if you do that right, you will, honest to God, boom your, boom your, boom your company. But I would say to them, we have a acquisition strategy that's very hard on our balance sheet. Why don't we move to an organic growth strategy? And I think they'll be interested. And by, and by doubling the amount of engagement. So if your company has 10 or 15 percent engagement, if you double it, you don't even have to have 100 percent. Just double that, and you'll have organic sales growth. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, exactly five minutes left. Uh, so I think uh, I will ask you a few more questions. Uh, there are so many, but uh, sorry that we don't have enough time. Um, uh, okay, this is also a very good practical question from a university student. Um, today, we cannot get jobs uh, easily in Korea. So young people, they are really you know, struggling uh, to find the jobs. 
Uh, so they are very nervous about uh, this situation even before graduation. And um, it's true that uh, universities are emphasizing employability uh, of their graduates. So they are putting attention to it, but it's still very difficult. So he says, uh, we cannot think about challenge. <laughs> so what do we do uh, for the future? Uh, well, you know, uh, what attitude uh, do we have to have for the future? I love that question. <clears throat> um, what the world needs more than anything right now, let's stay with Korea, what Korea needs more than anything right now is people who will build something. Build anything. Build a new business, build a church, build a nonprofit, build a charter school, just go build something. Because any of those things I just said, those are all economic energy. You don't just have to start the next Hyundai or, but any of those things that you start, and there's, um, and you you build that up, and there's really good jobs in there. But one of the things is, if you wanted to boom uh, Korea, um, what, what Korea needs, and, and again, the United States and Canada and the Americas too, but but they need to identify, get early identification of young people that are really interested in building something. And then, and then help them do that. Second thing is, when you come to Gallup and you're applying for a job or where you're going anywhere, the hottest thing in the world right now is you need new energy that can build new customers, that can build new teams. But present yourself as a builder. Figure out what your strengths are. Go to Gallup and take our strengths finder. But go present yourself as a person that wants to dedicate their life to building something. Because you can build something inside Samsung, inside uh, whatever it is, or you can start your own organization. But, but present yourself and get in the state of mind of building. That's what the whole world wants. Excellent uh, replies. Thank you so much. Uh, I think this will be last question. I'm sorry for the rest of these questions. Uh, there are about five more questions, but we don't have time for it. Uh, this is also a very serious question. <laughs> Obviously, you are very successful, and also this person says you are well-aged person. Well-aged person. <laughs> can, you get the, can you get their name? Because I'm going to send them. A, uh, yes, I'm going to uh, send them a new car. Yes, uh, Jean Jean <laughs> Lafon uh, is uh, she is an uh, exchange <laughs> student at the SNU from uh, France, uh, I think. Uh, so, what are your anticipations on your life and the society in the future? <laughs> well, I'm getting pretty old. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's a really good question to ask yourself. We ask this question of the whole world. Do you think the best part of your life is ahead of you or behind you? And it's not good as soon as you say you think it's behind you. But I believe the best part of my life is still ahead of me. So um, I got a lot of projects that I'm working on and that kind of thing. I am, as I made in my remarks, I'm very concerned about where the world is going right now because for some reason, the economy of the whole world is in decline. That means human development's in decline. That means that new businesses are starting slower. That means that big businesses are slowing down. But the whole economic thing isn't good. It's a very serious problem. There is a solution. All of these things are built by people, not, not fiscal tools. And I'm 100% optimistic that leaders will turn this around. We're on too many wrong tracks right now, um, but I'm, 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 I'm very optimistic that, that Korea will fix their problems, America will fix hers, West Europe will fix theirs. Um, we just got to get on the right track. Thank you for your positive thinking. So. Uh, Natalie just came back, so this uh, will be truly last last question. Um, so this is uh, a uh, person who works for, I think, uh, a daily newspaper. Um, so she has a question for Natalie. How effective could a MOOC, Massive Online uh, Course, uh, be uh, for educational diversity? MOOCs are a fantastic tool and they are developing at a very fast pace. Um, but one should not um, get it wrong. 
you can learn a lot thanks to MOOCs, but then uh, there are things that are missing. First, uh, to uh, exchange with other students. Uh, what is the most important when you organize a class is not always the teacher. It's more the quality of the students themselves and the way uh, they enrich themselves by learning together. If you learn by your, yourself uh, at home, uh, listening to a, a, a video, it's not exactly the same. And the second thing is that you need to interact with your teacher. You need uh, uh, coaching. You, you, you mentioned this notion of coaching. And to my view, uh, my institution is not a training in institution. It's a coaching institution. We accompany talents. We make them grow. Uh, and you need someone to uh, tell you, yes, go further in this direction. No, wrong way. Or, wow, that's interesting. You cannot do it by, uh, by yourself on your own. So thank you very much. I think uh, in closing, I like to maybe add my own interpretation. What I heard is that we really needed to consult each other, care for each other, coaching each other. The old way of uh, you know, top down, command and control is uh, no longer valid. It's not effective. Um, so we needed to promote more really close dialogue and uh, open communication collaboration, cooperation, helping each other with positive thinking. I know we are all suffering right now today, um, but uh, with the positive thinking, I think uh, we should be able to rise up, especially for millennials. Instead of uh, trying to job searching, actually at KAIST what I emphasize is job creation. So we have an uh, institute for startup KAIST and uh, people used to be afraid of uh, having startups, but now students seem to have more courage. Uh, for startup, uh, but it's not alone. As a team, I think we can do a lot more startup and the build a nation. So thank you very much, and I invite you to give a big, big round of applause to these two speakers. <laughs>